Isis, Osiris, Ra. Why are the names of Egyptian gods applied to buttes and monuments in the Grand Canyon? Some people argue that these are secret clues about the existence of an Egyptian city hidden in the depths of the canyon. And I think those names are related to that Egyptian city, but probably not in the way you would expect. That story arose from a newspaper article published in 1909 by a hoaxer who claimed to have discovered an ancient city populated by as many as 50,000 people that had hieroglyphics and a statue that looked like Buddha. The hoaxer, likely an elderly man named Mulhattan, who had perpetuated such stories around the U.S. for decades, was in poor health and living in Arizona. He certainly didn't row a wooden boat down the Colorado River, as claimed in that newspaper story, but he did have access to newspapers and maps, like this one from 1907. And clustered all in one place are the elements of his story, the El Tavar Hotel, incorporated in the story as El Tavar Crystal Canyon, and the decades before named monuments or temples, Isis, Osiris, and Buddha temples. The inclusion of a statue of Buddha in the newspaper story was strange, but may well be explained by the creator consulting a map before creating the hoax. The story did not create the Egyptian names, but the Egyptian names may have helped create the story. Plus, the Egyptian names are not in the area of the supposed location of the secret cave near the little Colorado River. They're deep in the canyon near the historic village. The closest monuments to the supposed cave location with godly names are of Greek gods, Jupiter, Venus, and Apollo. So, why are there geological features with Egyptian names at Grand Canyon? And more broadly, why do many of the buttes and monuments have the names of gods of religions from the world? Long before the Egyptian cave story, the names of Egyptian gods were assigned to geological features in the Grand Canyon by Clarence Dutton, sometimes known as the poet geologist of Grand Canyon. And that's perhaps the more interesting part of this story. Shiva, Brahma, Rama, Confucius, Buddha, Cheops, Ra, Isis, Jupiter, Venus, Apollo, all names of geological features of the canyon. What was Dutton thinking? A deep dive into Dutton's history provides a clue. Dutton was born in 1841, the son of a shoemaker. He was bright and could have gone to college at age 14, but waited a year entering Yale Divinity School, destined for the ministry. He had a strong interest in literature, winning a literary prize at Yale, but he promptly abandoned religion for the study of science, and he dedicated his life to it. Dutton attended graduate school, slowly turning to the study of geology, with his studies interrupted to serve in the Civil War where he was wounded but rose to the rank of lieutenant, specializing in ordnance. He stuck with this job throughout his scientific career, providing for him and his family and allowing him to be loaned, while still collecting a salary, to scientific missions. Eventually stationed in Washington, D.C., Dutton met one-armed Civil War hero and Grand Canyon explorer John Wesley Powell in 1872, and they became close friends. Dutton was assigned to do geological work in the West and became fascinated with the Grand Canyon. He did several trips in the 1870s, leading to the publication of his famed Tertiary History of the Grand Canyon in 1882 by the U.S. Geological Survey, a division of the U.S. government. It's that document that gives most people their sense of why Dutton chose his naming convention, and most analyses end there. The publication was certainly subject to some pretty flowery prose. Dutton, like me, seems to have appreciated the canyon at dusk. He wrote, quote, Within the abyss the darkness gathers, gradually the shades deepen and ascend, hiding the opposite wall and enveloping the great temples. For a few moments the summits of these majestic piles seem to float upon a sea of blackness, then vanish in the darkness, and, wrapped in the impenetrable mantle of the night, they await the glory of the coming day. Suffice it to say, Dutton felt the beauty of the canyon at least superficially justified the unusual naming convention. But here's where this script 
deviates from the usual account of Dutton's reasons. Dutton was familiar with religion. He started out studying to be a minister, but he quickly abandoned that path and dedicated his life to science. In modern days, scientists are the group most likely to be atheists. Dutton himself was described as being agnostic. But as Aveling said, quote, agnostic is simply atheist writ respectable, and atheist is simply agnostic writ aggressive. One could guess that by using names from around the world, Dutton was assuring that this natural wonder belonged to the whole world, not just the United States. But that does not explain why those international names are of gods. This is unlikely accidental. A biographer of Dutton interviewed his son, who said late in life he would dictate an 11,000 word manuscript and later make only two corrections. Dutton was meticulously organized in thought and presentation. I don't think the choice of the names was accidental. Understanding that Dutton did not believe in God and that he rejected religion and dedicated his life to science opens another avenue. Dutton's message may have been, if all the other gods people believe in so fervently are false, perhaps the god you believe in so fervently is false as well. Dutton's naming convention was not arbitrary and it was not without organized thought. This may well have been his subtly subversive message. But only if there were a hidden key to Dutton's motivations, a hidden key that unlocks the superficially inexplicable naming conventions. And there is. Zoroaster Temple, located smack dab in the middle of the canyon and clearly visible from the viewpoints around the historic village, Zoroaster Temple provides a secret key to Dutton's choices. Zoroaster, also known as Zarathustra, would be an especially obscure choice for one of the most prominent monuments at Grand Canyon, except for a writer who brought him to prominence in an 1882 book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. It inspired Strauss's tone poem, also spoke Zarathustra, a piece of music often used in conjunction with inspiring landscapes like Grand Canyon. And Frederick Nietzsche's shocking and memorable quote from that book and earlier writings is, God is dead. Yup, Zoroaster Temple is named after the character who said, God is dead. Now, Dutton was not independently wealthy like some of his peers. Although he was a brilliant and respected scientist, he needed to support himself, his family, and his scientific endeavors. In fact, after his time at Grand Canyon, he was promoted to major and commanded the San Antonio, Texas arsenal for eight more years. If he put a statement like, God is dead, into his 1882 government publication, he likely would have been quickly jobless. In fact, although naming Zoroaster Temple is attributed to Dutton, he did not put it in his historical manuscript, and the name was not officially recognized until 1906 when the hullabaloo about the book had died down. Dutton was careful. He chose a subtly subversive strategy to make his point, a strategy that goes unrecognized by most to this day. Most attribute his unusual name and convention to being the poet geologist of Grand Canyon. Few look any further. Why would a man of science use the name of gods? It's puzzling until you understand the personal context and find the hidden key. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and thank you for watching.